the Church of the Movement of Spiritual and Awareness is ecumenical. It's non-denominational. So it boils down to this type of a statement. I don't care what religion you're in or what you call God as your favorite name. It's absolutely immaterial to me. And it's only material to you if you make it so. And part of the ground rules of a seminar, and there are only a few, one is whatever I don't say that you want to hear, tell it to yourself. Then you've heard it. Um, the second one is, if you think I'm going to tell you what you know, there's no need for you to come here. You already know that. So I might not be telling you what you know. The second one is, I'm more inter or third, I'm more interested in communicating to you than having real precise English information. I'd rather have you get what's going on rather than just to have, oh, that was very poetic in the way you express that. I can do that and people get caught up with the poetry of it and then they miss the spirit of it. Uh, fourth thing you should probably know is my body is not the reference point for anything but the soul and spirit inside of me and the soul and spirit inside of you is the reference point and we're going to talk about that. Here's, that's all the good news. Here's the bad news. What I'm going to talk about, we won't be able to understand. We won't be able to get a hold of it. There's no way we're going to be able to argue or debate it. This will really be a monologue, even though undoubtedly the spirit in you will communicate to my spirit and I'll be saying some information and you'll say, oh, that's what I was wondering about. And very frankly, I don't know who gets that. I just know that it goes out someplace. This tape will be shown in theory, if not fact, all around the world. And some of the information that is not for you will be for someone else who will be listening to the tape and they'll say, that's what I needed to know. And since the spirit doesn't work on a timeline called in 10 weeks, it'll give me the information and it all seems to be right here now and we have to sort that out intellectually and through reading, through studying. Uh, therefore, all the information seems to come down at one time. And a person asked me in Mexico City many years ago to define time. And this was one of those iconoclastic individuals who really had studied time a great deal, figuring if you figured out time, you had everything figured out. And so he said to me, as the ultimatum of whether he stayed and heard, heard any more, what is time? And I said, time is the thing that happens that stops everything from happening all at one time. <laughs> and he'd, he'd just sit back in his chair and sit there and stayed for the rest of the evening because he'd never heard of that one. I don't know what time is other than that. I do know that in the spirit, there's no time. Everything is happening now. And as it happens, it happens on the level of awareness that we're attuned to. Uh, are you people aware of, of the psychological test they call the Rorschach ink block test? Very, very similarly, or simply put, some psychologists dropped ink blots on a piece of paper and folded it. And then they opened it and they let it dry. And then they did this to a series of them. And then they had people look at them and the people told what they saw. It's quite obvious they were projecting from inside themselves onto the piece of paper what they saw. So then they decided that was a wonderful thing to study and it became a part of psychological weaponry to find out what people are thinking. And I found it a much simpler method, I just ask them, what are you thinking? <laughs> and it's amazing that they'll just tell you instead of trying to find out. And I usually tell them why I'm asking that. I don't know what's going on, could you tell me? And most everyone wants to be the teacher, so I'm a student and I learn. 
But these vibrations that we're dealing with are much like people interpreting the ink block tests. If you show one to one person, they'll say it's one thing and somebody else will say it's another. And if we're looking at life as having a vibration level, and let's just draw these and say that we'll call them letters of the alphabet A, B, C, and we'll put this in the D. We found some very, very strange things spiritually that are now being found out scientifically. And the reason they're being found out scientifically is because the spiritual people are talking about it. And the scientists used to go along and say, oh, that's nuts, that's not true, there's no way you can prove that. First of all, it was nuts. Secondly, it was not not true. And third, we couldn't prove it. But neither, neither could they disprove it. So some took on them the chore of disproving the spiritual things that we find out. Now, first of all, I'm not even going to tell you anything that I don't know or that I haven't experienced. And if I do, I'll say, so-and-so said this or it was, I read it in this book. I don't know if that's so. So that you can understand where that comes from. The other things come right out of my experience uh, of living life and living in the spirit world. I will tell you this, as very strange as it may be, most people approach the physical world looking this way, straightforward, and some people approach the spiritual world looking this way, straightforward. And the spiritual world is backwards to that. And if you try to look directly ahead to see something spiritually, you can't because the mind is there focusing on materiality. But it's amazing what you see out of the side of your eye over here is where you see the spirit. And some of you have probably been sitting in the room and you thought you saw something and you looked over and it wasn't there. But if, when you look ahead, it's over there again. You go, there's something, somebody, there's a, something in the room with me. Sometimes we feel it or we sense it. And if we go to tell somebody, they go, let's take you down and get some pills or shots or uh, lobotomy at the worst. We'll cut your brain apart. Because you're not supposed to see and feel those things. Now here comes a question. If we're being influenced in our personality, what we call mind, emotion, and body, by something that we can't see, and let's make it disastrous like... Uh, radiation or x-ray or microwaves could you not understand the idea that it might be to your advantage to know that because if it's affecting you and you start to have emotional problems you could say oh that's coming because I had this type of exposure if you ate some food and in the middle of the night you woke up and you were very very ill instead of going to the hospital and having them take out your appendix or your stomach, wouldn't it be nice to know that maybe you had bad food and that you could regurgitate that and start to feel better? So the more we know about what influences us, the more we are capable to cope with things in this world. Not all of us are being influenced by the same things. And that may sound strange to you. And let's just sort of say, what are the, some of the things that we're influenced by? First of all, genetics. Those things you inherit from your mother and father. The things that you'd hate about your mother and dad are probably inside of you. So when you look at your mom and dad, you might want to smile and say, thanks for whatever you gave me. However, what you got from them and what you do with them are two different things. Because you can have a lot of willpower to change life. Another thing is the environment. This sounds very simple to you, but I'm just laying some groundwork. You people from Canada are very different from the people from Mexico. The people who are here who are Israeli are genetically and environmentally different from the people who might be in Egypt or Finland or Norway. 
and and i think historically we look at the german nation as being genetically environmentally quite different than anything else and in america now we're looking at the japanese as being environmentally genetically different than anything else and we do that according to a lot of things and one of them is called money so however much money things cost us influences what we're going to do if you had enough money to do everything you want to do money would not be a thing you'd be concerned about and if I talk about money in here and you have less money than you want that'll be your biggest objection to anything I say you are always talking about money you know we we sent out a brochure to our mailing list and in that brochure there were I'll just give you an idea about 35,000 characters and out of those 35,000 characters those like A, B, C, D the letters uh, 250 of them dealt with a dollar sign and it was letting people know that there would be workshops and it cost this much money and there was uh, trips to different places that cost this much money and we just informed people how much it is and one person wrote back and said you have this many dollar signs in your literature are you in this for the money and the answer is if we're in it for the money there would be bigger signs letters numbers behind the dollar signs no we were not then it was well why do you talk about that I'll tell you something that very few people know on the earth and and let me say it in American terms the dollar bill is king if I was in Japan I'd say the yen is we call it dollar up here. Looney. Looney, okay. But I, but it's it's to understand that we will do an awful lot of things for that thing that's called the dollar. And somebody once said, uh, "Money is the root of all evil." Has anybody ever heard that thing? Money is the root of all evil. It's a misquote. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. I don't know if it's the root of all evil, but it seems like you can get all the evil you want if you got a lot of money. <laughs> so some things are misquoted, and we don't care to get into that. And if I misquote it, just go, is a misquote, and forget it. There's one of the big guidelines here is whatever I say to you, if it works for you, use it. If it doesn't, let it go. It may not be for you. It may be for someone else in here. And a week from now, you may run them to somebody and they'll start to ask you something. And you'll remember what was said here and you'll say, well, I don't know, but I heard the other night this. And you'll tell it to them. They'll go, that solved my problem. So sometimes we're here to get information, not just for ourselves, but for other people that we're going to be running into. So therefore, if we're going to be taking care of ourselves so we can be taking care of others, it pays attention inside of us and it's wise to do so to get as much as we can to assist ourselves and anyone else we run into. So looking at that, I think you can understand that the environment here, these vibrations could just be golly, many, many, many. Uh, when I first started talking about this years ago at the University of California in Santa Barbara, some of the young physicists in there and, you know, there's nothing quite so bad as a sophomore at a university because they, they know it all at that point, and then they're going to find out in the next few years what they didn't know. And they were sitting there telling me, there are no such things as these invisible waves of energy coming through the room, and it's really uh, ridiculous of you and a sham and a hoax and all that for you to even think that there's anything like that going on in the room, let alone to try to convince somebody that there's those things going on through this room. And I sit there and let them vent their spleen, run up their flag to see how many wanted to salute it. I said, so you don't think there's energy and information going through this room and sound and light and you can't see it? And they go, definitely not. So I just turned on the radio. <laughs> they said, well, yeah, but that's a radio. I said, well, that qualifies. You never heard it until I turned it on. Turned on the television. They said, well, but that's television. I said, well, you said it couldn't happen. And there it is. Went over to a 
record player and put that on and start spinning it. And they said, well, but that's a record. And the, and the sound was already impinged into that. I said, I really can't do much for you. I think you'd be smart to go home now because you're too smart for everything else that's in this room. But before you go, I said, I want you just to hold up your hand. And so they held up their hand. And I just moved my hand like that across the room. And they said, wow, what was that? And I said, that's what you can't see or hear. And it's real and it can be felt. It's called the human spirit radiating. Anyone can do it. Anyone can feel it. Well, let's see. All right? If, if it's true that these physicists who didn't know anything could feel it, can anybody else feel it? Well, in the movement of spiritual inner awareness, we say, check it out. Check it out means if you say that so, and you say that that can happen, can it happen now? Let's just hold up your hands like this. They don't have to be real high. Just enough. It's a point of contact. And all I'm going to do is just take my hand and just run it through the room very easy. But you have to watch. Some people feel the energy across their hand. Some get it through the forehead. Some their eyes will bloodshot. Others will say, it went down through into my stomach. And some will say, it hit my feet. Now that's just a clue in where all they could be. Now one person said, you shouldn't tell them all that that can happen because then they'll create it psychologically. I said, well, let's try it. That's for the right-handers. <laughs> now you have to remember there's an air conditioning going in here, so discount that. Now, how many of you felt anything? And how many did not feel anything? You people didn't feel anything, just hold your hands right where they are. Just hold them right where they are. You didn't, you didn't feel anything. Now you got yours like this, hold it up, because there's receptors in the hand. I can see it go on your forehead, right across here in front of you. Let's come back. Then we try to up the energy this way. And you build a ball of energy, and you just toss it. Now, you people that didn't feel it, you just keep your hands up if you did not feel that. Good, because this shows you it's not mass hypnosis. This shows you it is not the power of suggestion, or everyone should have gotten that. But how about the bottom of your right foot? You feel the buzz? No, the lady right here. Yeah. Feel warmth and buzzing in the bottom of your right foot, right around your big toe. You just look at it, because somebody right there, I saw it go right down their leg. Was it the lady next to you? You? Was there buzzing in your foot? <laughs> see, I can, I can see it. It looks like, an, like something's vibrating in your foot around your right toe. Not because you got your foot crossed and it shuts off the blood. Because this doesn't go like I say it goes. This goes many different ways. Now, you didn't feel it. Let's see if we can just increase it for you. Now, this is what we call pulsing it. You go like that. Got it? Yeah, slight sensation. You didn't expect somebody to hit your baseball bat. This technically cannot be done, by the way, because human beings are supposed to be receiving stations. That was the, that was the psychological setup for centuries. But we find out now that we're also sending stations. That we can have a thought and we can send it out. And we can get a sensation about something's going to happen. And it happens and we go, there it was. But we don't know what it was because we didn't get the picture of it entirely. We can, though. We can get the pictures of that. Now, what are the things that get in the way of people receiving? And that's probably one of the better questions to have. And if you were just 
going to just say i think i know what would be getting the way of somebody that would feel or sense the presence of the spirit what do you think they would be just start yelling out some resistance fear anger what was the other one yeah let's call it expectations would that still be preconceptions doubt Uh, your uh, thinking resistance fear anger how about just depression just a general state where you say just my whole life is sort of depressed and let me give you one that I found out really has a great deal to do with it health and you're probably thinking if you're in good health you can feel that better as a matter of fact it doesn't work that way often the worse health you're in the more you tune to the spirit because you finally have given up almost all your resistance all your fighting and you're saying oh God anything and what would then be some of the things that would happen so that you could receive it Probably loving would be one of the keys. Open. And let's call that on the mind. Relaxed is a big key. All of the metaphysicians are teaching meditation called, first of all, let's relax your body. Because maybe we can relax your mind if we can relax your body. Okay, and receptive. That's certainly got to be a big one. Huh? Might work. I think curious as the first thing called. I came here tonight because I was curious. That would be a starting of it, but you may not feel anything more than just curious. Yeah. Tragedies. Yeah. It's amazing. Let's just call tragedy and suffering sort of on the, on the same wavelength. When we, when we see, uh, right now we're seeing tragedy in China, where uh, we're according to the reports, thousands of students in senior go, Chinese students have been run over by armored vehicles. And those are all dynamically loaded words, aren't they? Chinese students being run over by motorized vehicles and leaving their bodies lying there and then the army comes in and takes the bodies and hides them so they can't tell how many they got killed and boy you can really get a drama going and then it's amazing how it starts to unify the rest of the country and we've seen this in the east too haven't we and all the stuff that's gone over in the, in the mid east with all those people having difficulties the words they use there's no way they can come together because they use words of war words of, of hatred and have you ever found out that when you get angry at somebody usually a physical action called throw at them starts to appear and if somebody throws something at you what's your first thing defense pick it up throw it back while we're doing that we're probably coming into nothing that's in this it would be on this other page where we're called anger and retaliation and vengeance Except there's one thing about vengeance. It says in the Bible, the Lord said, vengeance is mine. So that's really saying, you people stay out of it, because maybe we're too vengeful. We might go too far. So we might just say, okay, Lord, you handle it. They did it, you handle it. And then the Lord doesn't do it, and you go, well, you know, what a sneaker. You know, you're supposed to handle it. Uh, but in his own due time, he does what he does. And I haven't been able to control him. Has anybody else in here been able to do that? I hear a lot of people on television get together and say, Lord, we claim and we want, and they grab hold of hands and they do this big emotional flooding thing. And next week they do the same thing and other people say, it didn't happen. Well, it should have because God promised it and we did it. I don't think that's what God promised. I think he said, if you gather together in my name, 
which is another way of saying in my purpose or in my will or for what I want done, I'll help you do it. But I've never seen people do it that way. They do it for their own good. Now, I'm not against that, but I just don't think you should blame God for stuff you don't get when you're doing it for your own good. Maybe if you're doing it for the whole group, that historically God always took care of his people, historically. And he always punished them if they didn't follow the commandments. So, I'm not too sure it's the same one that's living today, but there's a good chance. Because there's a lot of people that are, right now, the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, left the physical planet, and uh, they're ripping everything off of him to try to get a piece of him, because not who he is, but who he represents himself to have been, the entire religion. That's a real big thing to have, because there's a lot of people in the same religion who are saying, I don't believe all that stuff. And so, some of the things that will affect us to receive, or to open to receive, will be going in the same direction. How many of you took insight? I've taken insight. Remember that first day in there, you go, why am I here? You know, this is about one of the dumbest things that's come along since, I don't know, shoelaces or Velcro. Well, which is pretty smart if you owned it. The second day you're in there, you go, I don't know why I came back, but something feels a little different inside. And so back comes Friday, and the facilitator has just insulted you in every way possible, only by presenting ideas on the board like this, and then you insult yourself by what's been presented there. And finally, something inside of you goes, my God, I'm having these experiences with other people, and I found out that what I thought I believed and what is happening are different. So now, it's up for grabs. What's real versus what do I think? Comes Saturday, and boy, they start to go in to look at things much deeper. And, but someplace inside of you, you feel something feeling real good. Like something good is about to happen. And usually about the time you want to go home, your wife goes, sit down. <laughs> or, or something like that. Or your friend says, I'm not going, and I got the keys to the car. And then they're not going to come back. On the way home, Saturday, they go, I'm not coming back. That's it. I'm not coming back. I'm not. That's it. I'm not coming back. They call back later and say, I'll go, but I don't want to. Come Sunday, all this magic takes place that started Friday with the dumbness of you showing up. And it all took place inside of you because you somehow said, I am willing to look. And I'm willing to say where I am with what's going on for me. I'm willing just to be honest with, with my feelings in this moment. And we're not dealing with the truth because that shifts too fast. And so does honesty, by the way. And then you get all through and they have a ceremony and you just find tears all over the place. You go, why, have I, why am I crying over something that's so dumb and stupid and I just can't believe it and it's ridiculous, but I want to take it to my folks in my country and we're going to have it there. What, something that you hated and disliked? It's like, no, because it's, I, I really, and they use this expression, I really needed this experience. Why? Because my heart had hardened down. And insight goes and pulls it open with you doing the pulling. And it presents the information for you to pull. The church does the same thing. But while it's insights out here in the world, the church is saying, go back inside. You remember that day they did the inner communication experience where you went into your sanctuary? And lo and behold, you did and said things that you couldn't possibly have known about? We call that spook time or woo-woo time where you go, wow, that's scary. I'm scared. Can other people do this? Everybody on the planet can do it. Well, then we shouldn't teach it to them. Why not? Well, they'll use it against me. They will you because you've got that thought going. Well, we can send out wonderful vibrations to a lot of people of peace and harmony and balance. It'll work for you. And what do you get back? Wonderful vibrations of peace and harmony and balance. They say, I don't believe that. They take it to another country. They do it. We've been doing this in South America for a long time in Australia, in Germany. Do you know what? 
the results are almost predictable. I've told some of the facilitators, listen, all you have to do is go in there, light a candle, sit on a chair upon the stage, and just play a tape periodically, give them directions, let people do what they want to do, and at the end of five days, they'll come out with about the same thing. <laughs> and the facilitators, no, that's not true. Well, it is true. It's because the people are facilitating themselves, and all the person up in the front is doing is laying out information for you to look at, and when you grasp it, you will, out of the innate nature of your beingness, start to go up. Then you think, that's it, and they say, take insight too. You go, you're in it for the money. Nah, that's stupid. I charge a lot more for that. You finish insight two, and they say, insight three. Well, in the church, the movement of spiritual awareness, we say, do discourses. Do the soul awareness tapes to keep tuned in. Read these books. Get going on this. Why? There's so much in this world that can take us from, well, you know, it's like a guy who's just married and he's got to go someplace and for sake of expression, let's call it real. And he has to go down by Copacabana Beach or Ipanema Beach and you see some of the more beautiful women in the world down there. He's just married, his wife's at home, and he now knows what lovemaking is all about. And when he's far away from home and his vision grows dim of his wife, the vision of those ladies present on the beach grows very bright. What's going to keep him from straying? Generally, not much. Not much. Because we're trained to look out there in the world and to represent ourselves in terms of the world. At the same time, every religion has said, if you're going to find the world, you must first find yourself. And they've all said something very, very, oh, I'd, let me say specifically similar. Meditate, contemplate, pray but go inside. We've tried all those. We've prayed. Often about the most thing you get done out of prayer is sore knees. And I'm serious about that statement. If you do it in mass, you get emotional flooding. I mean, everybody's feeling the spirit, and they go home and they all backslide. So that wasn't it. So then you meditate. And that's to sit and go back inside and come, try to come to the source of your mind, which is going to be absolutely, uh, you'll never do it. The mind can go on forever because it's tied to universal mind. So then we try to contemplate and we look at a rose or a plant or a flower and we try to move and can become one with that. Some part of us goes, ridiculous. But then we try to see it for what it is. And you can't see something for what it is until you see you for what you are. So that you can know the difference in those. So we teach the idea that if you're going to see the Lord, and if all the writings and teachings are accurate, and I'm here to tell you that that's my experience, that the Lord is found inside. When I see people praying to God, and they're praying like this, I wonder what they're praying to. Because there is the Lord of the air that we're all told to watch out for called the devil or Satan. And I see people reaching up that way. And you can get an experience putting your hands up in the air, flooding yourself with emotional fervor. And I caution people, I say, be very careful because you're leaving yourself open to that that can influence you that you don't know about. And a lot of people say, would well, you believe in devils, demons, and all that? Go, and I say, and angels, yes. I don't believe in them. I've had experiences with them. Do I believe you people are here? I don't have to believe you're here. I can see you. So I don't have to do that. I've had experiences with that. Does that scare me? No. I know what they are. You know who are most scared? The people that don't know what they are and start to imagine what they are. 
You go see a movie where they present a devil or something, and you go, oh, my God, maybe that's what it is. That's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says the angel, who is the brightest one in the heavens and the sun of the morning star, was called Lucifer. So when he shows up, do you think he's going to show up like a goat or a ram or smelling fetid or something like this? It says in the Scripture, he's sitting and talked with God at the time of Job and said to the Lord, Take your hand off Job so I can have my go at him. Well, who do you think they were talking to? Do you think God talks to a, a demonic being, ugly and stupid, when he was bright? I think we should realize that the angel comes dressed as a gentleman, or the devil comes dressed as a gentleman. And that's where we have to watch. I mean, if something horrendous, devilish, beastly thing came in the room, we'd all split out of here. And I'd probably be leading the pack. Because if it's like what they show in the movies, and I've never seen that. I've seen peculiar shaped beings as I've seen physically peculiarly shaped beings. I've seen people that didn't have bodies from the waist down that were born that way. And, and in people that's been in military uh, battles have seen people come away without arms and shoulders and legs and wonder however they could live. And then they're living. And you go, oh, God, not me. How would I do that? The same way the other person is. You say, it's so bad I couldn't stand it. You're making it that way. And I've visited people and others have visited people who have been crippled from various means, disease, war, whatever. And they walk out feeling better about themselves because a person who was ill or injured had such good spirits. And I've gone to minister to people to hospitals, and I came out being the one that was ministered to. And I kept thinking, geez, I went in there to do all this for them, and they did all that for me. But I don't think they could have done it for me if I wasn't open to do for them, which left it open for me to receive from them. And you know what they do? They'd invite me back, because I think they figured I needed more help. <laughs> and I went back. And I did need more help because I didn't have a heart that was compassionate. I had a heart that was loving. You know, love isn't a feeling, it's a decision. Compassion is something you experience where you get involved with somebody. And boy, I've seen people hurt so bad you think nobody could hurt as bad as that until one day it hits you, then you understand they're hurt. I also found out that when you're stepping into the grace of God, or if we go on to call it the Messiah energy, this messianic energy, the grace of that extends upon you, and you really feel the glory of that because you felt the pain of the other. But I reject the idea of no pain, no gain. But I do accept the idea that a lot of pain repairs things like getting your teeth fixed, getting surgery, all that. It repairs things. But I found out my gain took place mostly when I was relaxed, open, loving. And I don't mean just saying words, but there. And I said, Lord, your will, not mine. And it wasn't a statement, nor was it a desperation, but it was just the statement of that's what it is. And often nothing happened. Two days later, we be walking down the street, and it would happen. And I, I thought, <laughs> I was walking down the a street in Utah, and as I walked by there, I got this flash of bright light and an elevating consciousness and a real joy. And you feel like dancing around. And I was there for five or ten minutes, just euphorically uplifted. And I looked at this building, and I looked at the other places, and it was this building. And I walked across the street, and the thing disappeared. For the next four or five days, I would go and walk down the same way by that building. Because I thought this took place at that building. But I had all my evidence. Do you understand that? It didn't take place in that state ever again. 
I drove all over thinking, these Mormons up here have got something. And I went to a lot of the churches, found out, and said, anybody have any experiences down in front of that bank? <laughs> they go, what, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, did you feel the Lord or the Holy Spirit or God? I mean, him. They go, no, that's where I deposit my money and get my money. <laughs> then I was riding in my car down the road, and that thing came on me. And I was way out in the middle, someplace in Kansas. And it had been raining, and I stopped. And I had a, what you call a metaphysical experience. And I thought to myself, am I going to have to come and drive through this road when it rains in the middle of Kansas all the time to have this thing? Or is this something else different? I started finding out that it was happening randomly, irregularly, non-predictably, a lot of different places. And I finally figured out, and I would try to do superstitions. Have you ever done this one? If I get down to the end of this street before this car gets over to that red light, then I will get this later. And that's called bargaining. I never got collected on the bargain. I'd even slow down and go fast to try to judge it so I could be sure to get it. That's called controlling it. But I found that sitting down, relaxing, and clearing away the things we had on the other side that would block me, angers, resentments, irritations, oh, doubts, skepticisms, any of that had to go. And I was sitting meditating, I said, what is this that I must do to find this fast? And I heard a voice say, original innocence. I thought, Orig original innocence? You know, we've all heard of original sin. Original innocence. Original innocence means nothing's there. And I, and I said, is this like original learning? And I said, yes. And I said, who's talking? Who's, who's talking to me? Because I didn't know to say those things. Sometimes you'll talk, but you'll know, and you'll hear a voice, but you know that's yours because you know those things. And every once in a while, you'll hear a strange voice. You go, what was that? And every time you focus on it, it disappears. But as long as you're sitting back inside of you, pretty soon you can hear all sorts of voices because the mind starts to produce voices. And you have to be very careful which voice you start to follow because it can take you down to despair very, very fast. And I'll tell you how I, what difference I found. If the voice and the information did not have in it and around it loving, caring, sharing, health, wealth, happiness, prosperity, abundance, or riches, it was not what I cared to be involved with. Sometimes that voice would say, that person hurt you and they're going to be down at such and such a place and you can go there and you can get even if you want to. And I'd leave and go down there and sure enough, they'd be there. That voice was right, except if I got even, I knew that I was doing the wrong thing and I'd turn around and walk away and I checked it and it was so accurate. Golly, folks, you cannot believe how accurate the negative voice can be. And it would tell me so-and-so is saying bad things about you and within minutes of phone a dream, they'd say, so-and-so just said a bad thing about you. I'd go, wow. Then I thought, I don't want to have that. I want to only hear what's good about me. Well, that's intellectual dishonesty, folks. If you're going to hear the good, you got to be prepared to hear the bad. Then you know what you do? You choose which way you put your nose, to the good or to the bad. And I said, I want good. But I got to hear what the bad is in case there's some information in there so I can correct my life. Because I never thought for one minute, this is perfect. I knew it was good at times. And I was going for excellent but never did I buy this is perfect. In fact, the only thing I was told in the Spirit, the only thing that's perfect there is change. And then I was told, it's perfect just the way it is, and the problem with you, J.R., is you don't like it that way. <laughs> and that was true. I, I wanted some things quite differently. Then I said, well, if it's perfect, I better like it that way. And I didn't like it, but I let go of it. I just accepted it. It's what it is. They're doing what they're doing. I don't have to do that. 
life is fine, and life started to become fine. And over the 25 years, I have been ridiculed. I haven't been spit at yet. I've been or on. I've been spit at. I saw it coming, though, and I ducked. <laughs> I've had personal threats against my life. You know, people say, you show up in the city, we're going to kill you. So I showed up to see who it was that was going to kill me. I was, you get curious when somebody's going to do that. Some people go, I'm not going to go. And I go, fine, but you never know who the person was that gave the threat. And to be chastised by newspaper reporters and papers. and uh, But I had good television stuff. And I had a lot of good other things. But it seems like everything that somebody would say, well, this is a terrible, bad thing to do. I would look at it and i go, I wonder if that is. And I thought, you know, it's not as good as it could be. So we'd move it over in line more. Then I'd sit back and I'd say, thank God I heard that negative thing because now I've fixed that and this is better. And so I listened not to opinion, but to those people that said, see this thing that you're doing, see this way that's going on. In fact, the clothes I wear was told by the TV people, don't wear certain clothes because on TV you wash out and you look dead. So I said, okay, I'll change that. They say, don't do this, don't do that. They got equipment to look, and I listened to that. The feedback system from the physical world is very good, and we don't want to hear it. The feedback system from the spirit is perfect, and we corrupt it because we try to hear it and get it, and then we try to lord it over everyone else. That's when you fall fast and hard. The church teaches a few things. Whatever you hear from the speaker, do it as you please. Believe it, disbelieve it, it's entirely up to you. It's freely given. Whatever you do with it, it's your business. If you don't know what it is, check it out. How do you check out something? Go inside and see if it's so. When I heard one of the teachers say, inside is heaven. I thought, that's great. That's great. With all the junky things I had done, there's nowhere inside there could have been a heaven. I mean, God stole apples. I'd take my dad's car when I wasn't supposed to. I'd lied to my mother. I cheated on tests in school. You know, I'd uh, leave early from things or go late or not go or say I'd go someplace and then not keep my word. Just the general life things that people do. And then he said, the kingdom of heaven is within. And I looked in there and I said, boy, there's nowhere you're going to find a kingdom of heaven in there. You won't even find anything. Then they said, there's a pearl of great price in the kingdom of heaven. So I thought, maybe there's a pearl, a small, small pearl. And I contemplated that for years. Not necessarily contemplated. I beat myself up in my mind. Because you ask who, how, what, where, why, when, how come, how much, how often, when does it happen again, is it going to affect me, will I get it, won't I get it? And I said one day, I wished my mind would just leave me alone. It was amazing. It started leaving me alone. At the same time, I heard another speaker say, the kingdom of heaven can't, can't be located in you. If you come up in the body, you won't find it. If you cut open the body, you won't find the soul or the spirit. It's an attitude you take inside of you in there. Now that made sense to me. As stupid as I was, it made sense. Because it was made sense like if you're going to see the Lord, and the Lord's in the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven is inside of you, and you're made in the image of God because he said so, then maybe you better prepare yourself to see something really great. And you better have a real good attitude. I remember saying in the Bible, it says, stand in fear of the Lord. I used to think, not me. I'm not going to fear God. If he's God and God's God, God's going to know that I'm not going to fear him. And I'm not going to do that. And I was studying some old manuscripts with a, a preacher. And he said, this word fear is a strange word. I said, I don't believe that word is right. 
He said, what do you think it is? I said, I think I would stand in awe of the Lord. I mean, if the Lord showed up, I'd go, wow, wow, look who's here. The one that can do it for everybody, even if we can't do it for ourselves." And he started checking back, and he said, you know the word fear? It was awe. It was mistranslated in the Greek. I said, son of a gun. I'll stand in awe of the Lord because I don't know what that is. But to stand in fear is going to stop me from going towards it. Do you understand that? If you have fear, how many of you ever went, thought of going to see a movie? I don't have to raise your hands. And the movie was one that you were fearful of, so you didn't go to see it. Yeah. Right. And so if you're going to see the Lord and it's going to be scary and frightful and you're going to be judged and you're going to go to hell or some other place, who wants to go visit? So I'll wait until I clean up my act a little bit. And then the amazing thing is the spirit inside said, you didn't have to do anything because God took you just like you are. And I really felt smug on that one. I, I honest to God, I really thought, you took me just like I am. You take anything. You, that means you'll take everybody. That means not one soul is going to get lost. That had a lot of implications for me. God loves all of its creation. God is a loving God. God is loving everybody all the time. And we're having our coming and our going in God. This is fantastic. But I want to clean up my junk because, God, if you're going to take me like I am, if I can do more to make it better, I think I'll start to do that. And then it came down all the things of how to behave with mankind. And you know what they were? Ten commandments appeared. And the first one, thou shalt have no other God before me. I could not have envy, lust, jealousy, greed, anger in front of me that I contemplated on. I had idolatry going. It was so hard to think that that's what it was. Then I ran to a song that said, I'm keeping my eyes on you, Lord, keeping my eyes on you. I thought, wow. How do you do that? You got, I'm going to be walking around silent in meditation all day. How, how am I going to see anybody else? And then another one said, look for the divinity in all things. And then I opened my eyes up and I started to see that everyone had this, this light of God's Spirit shining out of them. And, I, and it's amazing how beautiful people became. And people that looked maybe ugly physically, had all of a sudden a radiant beauty. And that was their soul and spirit just shining through it all. And I just sit there amazed and I said, yeah, I'm keeping my eye on you, Lord. And then came the last few things. Judge not, lest you be judged. That was a hard one because I, I really want to do some judging. I really, I really did. I did do them too and then I gave it up. I said, I want to finish these few judgments. <laughs> and I, said, I, I did it. Yeah, you know. Then the last one came up. And he said, when you've done it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. The five-fingered gospel. Mother Teresa gave that to me. I knew it. But not till she took and put her fingers on my hand. You did it unto me that I got what she was doing and when I got what she was doing I got what I was doing and I also got what a lot of other people weren't doing but we're going to start doing more and more as they move towards it that became all of that moving the spiritual inner awareness to the source of creation inside of us the trip isn't over for me when I die, maybe, it'll be over here. But my experience is this is such a little part of all of it that the bigger part is really where I'd like to live anyway. So we can look at these few things just to say loving, open-minded, relaxed, receptive, curious, sometimes tragedies, same direction, openness to the Spirit of God. Well, sometimes resistance, fear, and anger, and expectations, and doubt, and negative thinking, and depressions, and health are things that stop us from being with God. 
But nevertheless, we have to have compassion when we find out from people came from different genetics, environments, and religions, and education. And we have to have a great big openness inside of us to let everybody with all of that fit in the same room. I think at that moment we're going to find peace on earth and goodwill towards men. And that's going to be our biggest lessons that we're here to learn now. Very special.